Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, Heat Stress, Key Indicators and Management Strategies. My name is Libby Eiholzer. I am moderating today. I work with the Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops Program, part of a eight county team in Western New York. Um, my colleague, Margaret Quasdorf from the Northwest team will be presenting part of the webinar today, along with our colleague, Alicia Drinke, who is from the Southwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team. Um, we thought of this, doing this webinar a month or so ago, uh, thinking, oh, maybe we're too late, but it looks like July has been quite the hot month and we are still uh, going to be presenting a pretty relevant topic for probably the rest of the summer. Um, we I originally brought up the idea for doing this webinar in English or in Spanish. Um, I was looking to colleagues who have experience to help me put the presentation together and then everybody got so excited we decided to do the whole thing in English as well. Um, so first up is going to be Alicia. She has uh, great experience working uh, with heat abatement, um, dealing with cows with heat stress, specifically on some dairies in California where she did her master's. With that, I'll turn it over to Alicia. Thanks. Great, thank you, Libby. To get us started, if folks could enter into the chat box where you are located and then how many people are watching at your location? Is it just you or do you have other folks watching the same computer with you as well? And so that should kick off our interactive section. And I wanna start off my presentation portion with an acknowledgement to my colleagues who have contributed to this presentation by providing many of the slides that I'm going to be covering, as well as those that have worked diligently on the concepts of identifying and abating heat load in dairy cows. And I see we have a lot of uh, things rolling into the chat, so definitely keep utilizing that. As a little bit of background, many of you likely know that heat stress is a prominent issue for dairy cattle. And heat typically becomes a problem for lactating cows around a THI of 68. THI takes into account both the temperature and the relative humidity and the compounding effects of those on cows. However, it is important to note that we see individual differences in cows' abilities to cope with heat. So while THI of 68 is a good benchmark, it shouldn't be the only hard and fast rule that you follow. When we see cows become heat stressed, they experience negative effects on their productivity and their health. And a few examples are decreases in milk production, lying time, and dry matter intake. And we should also note that heat stress can affect all ages and classes of animals, which we're gonna talk a, lot, a little bit more about later on today. And while some of you may be thinking that heat stress is limited to only a few weeks out of the year, uh, specifically in New York State, we see that the state average high temperatures for four months out of the year is 70 degrees or higher. And at these temperatures, cattle can experience increased heat loads and some of those negative effects that I just mentioned. And so now I want to dive a little bit further into what is heat stress and how can we detect it. In order to avoid heat stress, cows will work to cope with their environment. And when I'm referring to coping, I'm talking about the various natural mechanisms that cows utilize in order to try to deal with hot weather. So cows need to maintain their body temperature within a certain range in order to perform bodily functions, very similar to humans or pretty much any other animal, right? And so in order to do this, they have to balance the heat that they gain from the environment by releasing excess body heat. They often show a progression of different mechanisms in order to release excess body heat and also to avoid gaining any additional body heat. And so cows try to maintain their normal body temperature, which is generally between 100.4 and 102.8 degrees, which is represented by this normal line. 
as cows get hot and as time goes on, they may be unable to maintain their normal body temperature and therefore we see increases. As body temperature increases, we can see the negative effects like reduced milk production and fertility. If body temperature gets too high, and in extreme cases, we can actually see death or mortality. So in order to avoid gaining more body heat, cows will seek out shade. And they do this really early on. Another thing that we see happen early on when cows get hot is they will start to sweat. And this releases excess body heat when the sweat evaporates from their skin. And we're depicting this as leveling off pretty quickly since cows are limited in their sweating capacity, especially compared to other animals such as horses. Cows also release extra heat by breathing faster, which evaporates heat from their respiratory tract. And while there's no true magic number, we typically use the threshold of 60 or 80 breaths per minute to, defy, to decide if a cow's breathing rate is elevated. Along the same lines of breathing faster, cows will also pant. And on average, when we see panting, they are exhibiting a respiration rate of about 90 breaths per minute. And at this point, we know that body temperature has increased. So when we see cows panting, that's a telltale sign that they are having difficulty coping with the, their heat load. And while I'm sure many of you know what panting is, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. So panting looks similar to what is depicted here. And again, cows showing these signs will have about a respiration rate of 90 breaths per minute or higher. They will often exhibit drooling, they'll breathe with their mouth open, and sometimes their tongue may actually be extending or protruding out of their mouth. So kind of similar to a dog panting, right? And because panting, breathing fast, and sweating cause the cow to lose uh, water, they need to drink more when they are hot. So we will often see cows drinking more water or standing around the water trough more than usual in warmer weather. Rumination also produces a considerable amount of body heat, so cows will eat less to avoid gaining any additional body heat. So if I want to try to intervene before body temperature goes up and leads to those problems that I've discussed, I want to try to look at some of those earlier indicators. And one reliable indicator early on is an increase in respiration rate. And this happens really early on and it's pretty straightforward to measure. So something to look at if you want to know how your cows are doing. You can also evaluate other early signs of heat stress utilizing a cow-focused audit. And so you wanna look at a combination of respiration rate, drooling and panting, and if possible, body temperature. And so I wanna talk through how do we measure respiration rates briefly. You're gonna do this by counting the number of flank movements that you see to make up breaths per minute. And so one full breath is an in and an out movement. And you wanna make sure that you're counting the in and the out as one breath to make sure that you're getting an accurate measure. So if you stand there with a watch or a timer for 30 seconds and count the number of breaths that you see for 30 seconds and multiply that by two, you will then get the number of respirations per minute for your cow. And if it's around 40 breaths per minute or less, you can determine that she's doing pretty good. If it's above 60 breaths per minute, it is indicated as elevated. And so just to show you, when I'm doing this, I look at where the air was pointing here and watch for the in and the out movements. And again, one breath is an in and an out. You may need to stand and watch her breathing for a couple of seconds just to get the pattern before you start to time. And then if we were to actually time this video and time this respiration rate, we would get that she's at about 40 breaths per minute, which in warm weather is rather good. 
So she seems to be coping with the heat quite well. Now we don't always need to be um, at the rear of the cow in order to gauge respiration rate. As you can see from this video, we can still see the flank movements and uh, measure her respiration rate. And if we were to go ahead and time this girl's respiration rate, we would see that she's at about 90 breaths per minute. So in that elevated range. And even without timing them, I'm sure that you guys could tell the difference between these two videos, right? So uh, you may be able to do that uh, at some of the more extreme levels, but sometimes it's good to time the respiration rates for the intermediate breaths per minute. And while respiration rate can be an effective indicator of heat load, it also takes a great deal of time. So recent research has been evaluating the possibility of an easier method, like using the long stringy drool that you can see with this girl here. And so far, it seems that drool does tell us that cows are experiencing increased heat load and is an early indicator of heat stress if they are drooling, but if they are not ruminating or eating, which is an important distinction because we know that rumination and eating can cause drool. So if you see the drool only when they are not ruminating or eating, that may give you an indicator that their heat load is elevated. We do also need more research looking at the pen level data to determine uh, some more concrete recommendations for when additional cooling should be provided to the whole pen. So to review that part, heat stress is the buildup of uh, body and environmental heat, which cannot be coped with. High producing cows are often more susceptible to heat stress, but we do see a lot of individual variability with how well cope, cows can cope with heat stress. When we use cow-based indicators to inform how well they manage heat load, we want to look at increased respiration rate, drooling, panting, or breathing with the tongue extended, and then increases in body temperature. If cows are unable to cope and heat builds up, we see negative effects such as decreased feed consumption, losses in milk yield, which nationally we see a four to 7% loss every year, which equates to about $40 billion. We also see decreased reproductive success and immunity, as well as increased mortality. And while heat stress can be a huge issue, there are ways to mitigate the buildup of heat. Typically, the most common methods to utilize are shade, sand, and spray water. And so we have a poll question, which I'm not sure if our poll function ever got working. So uh, if you could type into the chat, do you, oh, okay, the poll question did pop up. So if you see that or feel free to type it into the chat, do you provide your uh, lactating cows cooling, and if so, we would love to know what kind. Give you a couple seconds to answer that. Okay, and while you um, wrap up those, I want to talk a little bit more about heat abatement and specifically starting with water. And water can be provided in many forms, but one of the most common ways that it's provided is in the form of soakers or sprinklers at the feed bunk. And for the sake of time, I'm only going to be covering the provision of soakers at the feed bunk. It is important to note though that water is a highly effective form of cooling for cows. And so to support this, I wanna show you a couple of examples of some body temperature graphs. So what you're looking at on the screen is on the left-hand side, we have body temperature that increases from the bottom up. And then along the bottom of the graph, we see time of day. The dashed line represents the fever threshold for dairy cows. And then this red line is the body temperature of cows during the summer 
in California that received shade only. And when we look at that red line across the day, we see that the body temperature increases across, uh, across the day and then goes above that fever threshold the second half of the day, which is not ideal because that can lead to those negative repercussions that we discussed. And thank you for everybody for responding to our poll question. You should have the results popped up on your screen now. And it looks like most people do provide fans and then a mix of other options. So in this study, they also gave cows access to sprinklers 24 hours a day, every day. And what they found is that cows will choose to use the sprinklers from about nine in the morning until six at night, which is indicated by this blue box here. And when they looked at cows that had access to those sprinklers or soakers, as well as the shade, they saw that by using sprinklers starting early in the day, that the body temperature of those cows stayed within the normal range throughout the entire day. And this is interesting because when we give cows a choice to utilize spray, they will instinctively go and start to utilize it prior to uh, the heat of the day really warming up. And so it seems like it may be beneficial to utilize a lower temperature threshold to provide heat abatement so that cows can electively go and keep their body temperatures cool. And so what this research helps show us is that cows know. They are very systematic in their choices in their use of heat abatement and they will do so in order to cope with uh, temperatures. And in summary, cows will utilize water to keep themselves cool and gauge their own heat load and respond accordingly. So next I wanna cover the provision of shade just a little bit as it's one of the most basic forms of heat abatement and ideally should be provided to all animals on the farm. And when we look at the research with shade, we also see that cows will choose to use this early on in order to cope. And I know that this is a pasture-based system, which not everybody has, but um, this is going to be the research that I'm showing you next. So let's look at another couple of graphs. And so what you're gonna be looking at is again, time of day is along the bottom. And then along the left-hand side of the graph, is the percent of cows utilizing shade at that time. On the right hand side is the amount of solar radiation or the number of sun rays in a day. So basically just gauging how, much, how sunny it is. And then the different colors that you're gonna see on the graph is depicting the amount of solar radiation that is blocked by the shade cloth that they're utilizing. They gave them different uh, structures that block different levels of that solar radiation. And I know that this is a lot to look at, um, but really the key takeaway that I want you to look at is that we see on sunny days, more cows use shade structures, especially during the daylight hours. So that nice bell curve shows us that as uh, the day goes on, more cows are utilizing shade structures and specifically the shade structures that block more solar radiation. So that green and that orange color. In contrast, on cloudy days, for the same exact study, they did not see that trend. You can see that it's pretty much flat. So cows on, cl on cloudy days will not utilize the shade structures to the same extent. And so this contributes to what we have learned in that cows will also choose to utilize shade based on the amount of solar radiation or sun on a given day. Again, emphasizing that cows will gauge their own heat load and respond accordingly. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that my colleague Margaret Quasworth can start sharing hers and pass it along to her.
All right. I think that we're set to go. Libby or somebody tell me if I'm not sharing properly. But so I'm Margaret Quasdorf. I'm the dairy management specialist for the Northwest New York Dairy Livestock and Field Crops team. Um, and Alicia did a really great job uh, covering lactating cows, but it's really important for us to also think about um, our dry cows and our calves um, when it comes to heat stress, because um, there are negative consequences associated um, with heat stress in, in both those life stages as well. So first off, I have a poll question. If people would uh, feel free to type in the chat box. Um, do you prefer heat abate or do you prefer, do you provide heat abatement for your dry cows? If so, what type? Um, and go ahead and, and type that right in the chat box. So heat stress, when we're looking at dry cows, what do we typically see? Um, just like in, just like in lactating cows, just like in lactating cows, um, we're going to see an increased rate of respiration. You might notice your cows going off of feed. They might be drinking more and um, hanging out around the waterers and the water troughs more often. They might look uncomfortable and you might see a bunch of extra standing and bunching. So in this picture here that we can see, I borrowed it from the Dairyland Initiative. Um, this is depicting actually a lactating pen, but dry cows do it too. Um, these are cows bunched to the edge of a pen and this is frustrating for us as dairymen because um, we've built these barns and, and these pens to make sure that these cows are comfortable and, and have the space that they need to uh, be productive and to have enough lying time um, space for their lying time. And a big stress response for the cow is to bunch, whether that um, is heat stress or a different stress, they tend to bunch together. So that's what we're seeing in this picture. Now, um, what's bad about bunching is that cows tend to spend more time standing up when they're, when they're hot, when they're too heat stressed, and that can uh, lead to a lot of negative effects down, down the road. So lasting effects due to standing um, in heat stress might be feet and leg issues, and you, you typically might see these happening two and a half months after a significant heat stress event. And this graph here shows that um, the number of lameness cases increases with the percentage of time that cows spend standing. And um, the most common um, foot issues you might see are uh, um, hoof horn lesions. And that's due to the cows standing for too long. Now the reason why they stand is to help dissipate heat off of their bodies, to increase the surface area exposed to the environment, and also um, some research has suggested that cows are able to pant better or breathe and respirate better when they're standing up versus when they're lying down. Other negative effects that you might see from dry cows who aren't cooled are metabolic issues. And this is gonna show up in your transition cows. You may see an increased rate of uh, displaced albumasomes or ketosis or um, milk fevers during that transition period. And also you might have a harder time having those cows take off and really uh, ruminate and digest properly after those issues. You might also see some reproductive issues during that next lactation. And then when it comes to the mammary gland and milk, um, cows that were not dried during their, or were not dried, were not cooled during their dry period, um, have a reduced colostrum production and quality and brand new research um, just this month in the Journal of Dairy Science said that um, heat stress can impair mammary gland turnover, affecting the secretory activity and productivity in the next lactation. So this actually has to do with gene expression um, that is affected when cows are not cooled during their dry period. So not only is just the cow affected, um, during a heat stress event to when they're dry cows, but that calf that they're carrying in utero is also impaired. And this has to do a lot with the impaired function of the placenta. And that's because uh, blood flows away from the core to the extremities in a heat stress event. 
um, and nutrients go with it. So the calf doesn't necessarily develop as it should. And this might lead to a reduced calf birth weight and growth rate. So there's a study that shows that calves born to dams who were not cooled over their dry period are actually 10 pounds less at birth. Um, and not only that, these calves tend to have a poor immunity, and that's due to poor IgG absorption from the colostrum. Um, so if you were to test, the, test these calves, you would see a higher rate of failure of passive immune transfer. And um, this has to do with premature gut closure. So of course, uh, poor immunity and um, a lower birth weight can have lifelong consequences. These calves have a greater chance of sickness and a lower survival rate in the first year of life. And of course, those who do make it through the first year of life, we see a, dis a decreased future uh, milk production and long-term retention in the herd. Um, one study showed that uh, heifers born from dams who were not cooled during their dry period produced 11 pounds less per day in the first 35 weeks of their first lactation than their peers from cooled cows. And we also see that some of these animals can have altered metabolism which means that they're gonna end up storing energy or glucose as fat versus putting that into milk production and reproductive performance. So we wanna avoid um, as much as we can some of these negative impacts of heat stress, but um, what can we do for our dry cows? Obviously we can cool them. So here we have uh, a picture of a cow who's about to give birth and we see it almost looks like a light right above her, but that's actually a fan that is helping blow the air um, down into that calving blind. You can see the fans in the background of the pen that um, other cows have access to, but this cow who is within her calving blind um, also has access to a fan, which is gonna help her stay more comfortable while she's calving in these, in these hot summer months. As Alicia talked about, um, water is a great resource for cooling cows. And just, with your lact just as with your lactating cows, you can also use water to cool your dry cows. So the first picture is showing soakers, um, wetting down cows. And what's most important here is that these soakers are on and have enough water coming through that these cows are really soaked to their skin. Um, you really want them not just water on the surface, but water all the way down to the skin. And when you add fans as well as soakers, you really get the, the best benefit of evaporative cooling. Now the picture on the right shows, um, it's hard to see, but right in front of that fan, there's a water drip. And what this is doing is that the as the water drips in front of the fan, it creates a mist and fine water droplets, which cools the air surrounding the cows. So that's another, another great way um, to use water in your cooling systems for your dry cows or your lactating cows. We also talked about shade. Um, here is an example um, of shade cloth on the sidewall of a barn going straight down. Now these cows are lactating cows and they're just getting up to go to the parlor, which is why they look a little disturbed right now. But yeah, as you can see, the shade is really blocking um, those sun rays coming in and providing um, shade across those stalls on the outside wall. And cows are more likely to lay down there um, than if there was sun shining down on that stall. On the right picture, you can see a dry cow facility. It's bedded with paper, shredded paper, but you can see a shade cloth coming down halfway. And though this is a cloudy day, it does um, show that more of the pen can be used on those sunny days when that sun is shining through, creating shade for those dry cows. Here's an example of a farm using shade cloth as an overhang. Um, you can see that um, they tried to make sure that it wasn't too long in order to not prevent uh, prevailing winds to come across and ventilate the barn. But it, it's a little hard to see, but you can see that there are a lot of cows laying down along that wall um, where that shade cloth is providing that additional cooling along that outside wall. And typically, um, cows will try and avoid, avoid the brightest parts of the pen during a heat stress event. So, having any of these options can help uh, cows better utilize their beds. 
Moving on to calves. Um, calves are more tolerant to high temperatures than cows, but they still need a little bit of extra attention. So younger calves and older calves have a different thermal neutral zone. And um, as calves start to eat solid feed, they start to develop their rumen. And that rumen generates heat. So calves greater than three weeks of age are going to have a little bit um, shorter range of heat tolerance. And that's up to about 70, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, new research shows um, that you should closely monitor your calves when the temperature humidity index reaches 65 to 69 and above. And that's similar to when we are watching our cows for heat stress. So that's also when you want to start to pay attention to signs that your calves are showing of heat stress. You might see a decreased intake and an increased uh, respiration when the temperature reaches about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. But that does depend on the humidity as well. So our goal is to keep calves healthy and growing. So how can we do that uh, during these times of heat stress? First of all, you got to get your team on board. Um, anybody who is responsible for um, raising the calves, whether that's feeding or moving them from the maternity pen or moving them on, you need to train everyone to recognize when a calf is not coping well with heat stress. And um, you're going to see in increased respiration rates, panting and drooling, just like we said before, reduced feed intake, and the calf might look depressed and have decreased activity. Right here we have a video, if I can start it, we have a video showing a calf experiencing heat stress. You can see um, her increased respiration rate. And that's a sign that she's, she's experiencing heat stress and could use a little bit of heat abatement. Next, we have a calf exhibiting panting and drooling, open mouth breathing, because this calf is in an extreme heat stress. Um, when calves start to get stressed like this, they are in, in danger of, of dying. So um, if something's not done to help mitigate the heat stress here, you, you have a higher risk of, of losing these calves. So things that should be in place definitely at all time is plentiful clean water in any type of calf housing. Um, I have two pictures here and I really like the picture on the left because it does show um, a milk bucket that has been washed out and cleaned but there's also a larger bucket uh, filled with water and even though um, this calf probably received milk in the morning and in the afternoon and possibly at noon also, um, this water is available for the calf to drink whenever. Um, she wants it. And the other picture again shows that a whole line of, of filled up water pails. Now a lot of people have the smaller buckets and, and get sick of trying to fill them, but uh, these, this farm in particular I think just went to a local store and I think these are more for horses, but they just bought, a, they made that investment and they bought a bunch of them and so they don't have to refill as often. It's also good for weaning calves. Uh, or weaned calves who drink a whole lot more water than the younger calves. Next, we're going to look at uh, heat abatement for calves in calf barns. So here we have a picture that shows a uh, positive pressure tube ventilation. And in the wintertime, our goal is to have four air exchanges per hour. But in the summer, we're, also, we're not only using this for uh, ventilation, but we're using this for heat abatement. So we want to get closer to 60 air exchanges per hour. Now the angle and the diameter of these holes in these different tubes and the number of them is going to determine, uh, is going to be determined by a number of different factors including the fan and the power of the fan and the size and dimension of your barn and how many animals are in there. So work with your consultants. There are resources out there through the Dairyland Initiative and through Cornell to help design these systems for your calf barn. Uh, cooled calves um, within calf barns have improvements in their average daily gain and feed efficiency and um, also are seen to have a reduced respiration rate and temperature versus calves who are not cooled. So I think some of these are pretty cool pictures. I worked with my friend and researcher Sarah Morrison at the Minor Institute in Chasey, New York to get these pictures. Um, this picture right here 
shows a bunch of different colors and this is actually of a calf hutch and you can kind of see the row of hutches behind the colorful picture. But the darker red colors indicate the higher temperatures and the lighter cooler colors indicate lower temperatures. And um, so we're just looking at a hutch right now. It's an empty hutch and you see the top where the, the black plastic is on the vent and the black gravel bag is on the back of the hutch. You can see that um, that has attracted and held more heat. So on the day that this photo was taken at this time, it was almost 85 degrees. And um, those black plastic pieces definitely held on to more heat, but the lighter hutch color um, was a lot cooler, was cooler than the black plastic and cooler than the air. These pictures were taken at a little bit different times a day, but now we're showing a calf sitting in front of her hutch. Um, it's also important to note that these calves, uh, or this camera only takes surface temperatures. So um, the internal temperature of the calf is likely higher than any of the numbers that you'll see on the screen here. But you see how uh, warm a calf is. You'll see the, the darker red spots of the black plastic on the hutches and it just kind of gives gives you an idea thinking about where the calf wants to lay and what kind of heat abatement strategies you might want to try considering what a hutch looks like um, in this case when it's close to 85 degrees and 90 degrees outside. So these other two pictures are showing the calf standing at the door of the hutch and laying down in the hutch and you can see um, as the calf lays down here, you can see her, the, her hottest part of her body is where um, she's trying to expose more surface area. And you see the outside is a little hotter and um, as she stands up, you can see the heat all around her body, but you can also see that it's cooler in the hutch than it is, than she is and then it is outside. Here's a calf, it's hard to tell what she's doing, but she's lying outside of her hutch. And you can see that in this case, um, her body is pretty hot, but she, there might be a little bit, it might be a little cooler right here in the spot than it was in her hutch. I know it says low, um, the purple color is indicating a low color as in the hutch might be cooler, but I think it's actually um, throwing a little bit of the shade this way. And that's why the calf is choosing to lay outside and exposing her body to the air to release some of that heat. There's no research. Uh, associated with these pictures yet, but um, we just thought it was really cool to see um, kind of where the heat is on heat stress calves. So what can we do for, for calves and hutches? Um, a, there's a lot of different ways to do this. Uh, this farm decided to raise up the back end of the hutch to allow for ventilation. She just used old buckets. You can use old blocks of wood. You can use um, some smaller old tires, but anything to get that, the back of that hutch up and allow a little bit of airflow underneath really does a lot to decrease the ammonia and carbon dioxide within the hutch and um, also allows for a little bit more air exchange um, to lower bacterial counts within the hutch. You could also open the windows. You can see these vents were closed. Um, it was actually about to rain when I took this picture, so they closed, they closed the vents. Next, um, we have pictures of shade cloth um, in the outdoor space of these calf hutches. So um, this was something new that this producer was trying and um, other producers in the area were trying. Um, so they just ran shade cloth across the top of the outside wire part enclosure of these hutches. And this allows a calf to have access to inside the hutch, allows to have shade access outside the hutch. And as you can see, the, the shade cloth doesn't cover the first part of the, of the wire cage here and allows her to lay in the sun if she did want to do that. Um, she does have to come out here to, to eat and drink, but she can easily go back, um, go back into either a shaded area or all the way in the hutch if she prefers. And this was um, talking to the producer. She said it was fairly inexpensive and um, didn't take too long to set up. And she just used these little snaps here to clip onto the, onto the wire and just ran it across, um, across the row of hutches. Now another 
thing that we should think about doing when we're bedding calves in the summer to avoid extra heat stress is to bed with sawdust or sand or a combination. You can put sand on the bottom and sawdust on the top to, do, uh, to have better drainage or just sand as long as calves aren't eating sand or sawdust. Um, we really want to avoid this um, deeply bedded straw, which is what we talk about um, in the winter time for, for dealing with cold stress. Um, this is really good for, for keeping heat in when, you, when they can nestle in. So we're, we're going to avoid that deeply bedded straw for the summer months and for high temperatures as that will increase the heat stress we have. All right, so other things that we can do. Um, as a team paying attention, raising our healthy calves, we can add a midday feeding of electrolytes. That's common on a lot of farms, just to keep those calves hydrated, especially if um, they're younger calves and they're getting most of their water through their milk feedings. Um, if you can just do a bottle feeding of electrolytes, they usually suck that right down and it keeps them hydrated. Um, otherwise, just making sure you have free choice clean water available at all times really goes a long way. Now, when calves aren't looking so good, uh, you should make sure that your people are trained to administer fluid sub-Q or IV. And if you're seeing calves that are overly dehydrated, you can perform the skin tent test, um, or you might notice sunken eyes, or the calf isn't very lively or getting up. This is a, or you might notice some scours too. This is really dangerous in hot weather, and um, that calf needs to be given fluids. And if you wait, if you wait more than a few hours, sometimes you can end up losing that calf. So um, know, know when to give fluids when you need them. And then another good tip is to perform any stressful activities early in the morning when the ambient temperature is low. So you don't want to have to um, add to the stress of the heat stress. And so save your vaccinations, dehorning, and pen movements for the early morning hours. And um, I just wanted to finish up here um, with a quote from a, a recent paper that says that uh, late gestation heat stress exerts carryover effect on at least two generations. Uh, providing heat abatement to dry pregnant dams is important to rescue milk loss of the dam and to prevent losses in their progeny, which just really sums up what I've been talking about here, how important heat stress abatement is for both our dry cows and our calves. Overall, some of our key points are that all age and classes of animals can experience heat stress, lactating through calves. And also, we didn't talk a lot about our, our weaned and growing heifers, um, but they can also experience heat stress. And it's important to try and do some of the same mitigation strategies for them as well. Heat stress is exhibited by drooling, increased respiration rate, and loss of milk production. Um, in our lactating cows and obviously not milk production in our dry cows, but throughout all stages of life, they can be affected. And then there can be long-term consequences on your foot health, reproduction, and performance of future generations. Shade is the most basic heat abatement, but water and fans definitely help. And that's what I just said. So with that, um, I think we will answer any questions we have in the chat next. Thank you. Great job, Margaret and Alicia. Thanks so much for providing so much great information today. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one that I'll have you answer, Margaret, is what equipment or tool was used to get the heat imagery of the calf hutches? I don't know exactly what it was called, but I can definitely get the brand and maybe the cost of it. I know it's a, a more expensive piece of equipment, but it's just like a, it's, it's a heat gun basically that does the imaging with the colors. So I can, if we have an email to go with that question, I can get back to them. Um, and I think that question was from Sophie, if you have more specific, if that's just what you're looking for, or if you need more specific information, just let us know. Um, all right, the next question is, would you recommend closing the vents to the calf hutches when it's raining? I think um, they were only closing the heat or closing the vents on those hutches because of really heavy rain 
was predicted and it did rain pretty hard following after I took those pictures. If it's just raining lightly and the rain isn't pouring into the back of the hutches, I would recommend leaving them open um, so that you can get that ventilation. I think they just really didn't want um, really wet bedding after that downpour. I know that they went through and opened them right up after. Super. Um, the next question also about hutches, as, or I guess it could be anywhere on the farm. Could you comment on whether it's worth putting water in shade to keep it cooler? There's research that shows that um, calves would, calves don't necessarily want to drink really warm or really cold water. So um, having the water where it stays cool in the shade probably would help, but if, as long as the water is not heating up to a, to a point where they are refusing to drink it, I think it's okay to keep it um, where it makes less of a mess in the pen. Um, I think that's, that's what I would recommend. Great. Um, next question, any research on whether group house calves are better able to manage their heat stress due to the type of housing? So group house meaning um, some kind of a greenhouse or barn structure with pens of, pens of calves on milk. I think there's a lot of research um, when it comes to ventilation and cooling in for calves in barns. I'm not sure if there's one that compares it in the same situation to hutches. I can definitely look into that more, but um, I think that there's cooling, I mean, there's heat abatement techniques for both. And yeah, I think you can control a little bit more the environment inside a barn as long as you're willing to invest in the, in the equipment to do so. But I'm not sure if there's research that has compared um, grouped house calves to hutches on, at the same time or on the same farm, but I will definitely look into that. Super. Okay, we've got a couple more questions here in the in the Q and A, and these I'm going to open up to. The other ones were calf related. These are just general um, and some lactating cow questions. So Alicia or Margaret, feel free to answer. The first one is. Is there any info on heat stress and pH of milk or urine? Margaret, I can chime in. I am sure that um, that data does exist. I personally don't know specifically about pH of milk and urine. Um, I just haven't specifically looked at that research, but it has been shown that heat stress can affect the composition of the milk, um, especially looking at your components. So I would imagine that pH is also affected. Anything you wanna to add to that, Margaret? I, I can't think off the top of my head either. I'd have to go back and look at the research too. All right, so we don't have a good answer to that one. Um, the, the next question is, what is the time lag between heat stress and its effects on reproduction? And then just in general, what are those effects that it has on reproduction? I don't know about the uh, lag and time for reproduction. I can't recall if this was specifically to reproduction, but um, we typically see some of those longer term effects um, within one or two days. So um, milk production specifically, we, we see decrease about one day to two days after a, a heat stress event. And I don't know specifically about the lag in reproduction. So Margaret, feel free to um, chime in if you have that number off the top of your head. Uh, but ultimately, it affects reproduction by just um, limiting the capabilities of the reproductive tract and preventing the cow from going through her appropriate cycle and, you know, 
affecting the release of the egg and the um, estrus and all of her um, signs of heat as well. I think that's a pretty good answer or a, a pretty good information there. I'm not sure about the lag time either. Um, yeah, I, I would just comment that, you know, typically on farms, you'll see in the, the hottest months and, you know, kind of the later end of the summer is when you tend to see um, more issues with with cows actually getting pregnant and staying pregnant. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's not only that, it sometimes is that cows don't get pregnant in the first place, but a lot of times there's the early embryonic death just because the cow is so hot. <laughs> Right. Um, yep. it's affecting, affecting the embryo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we'll just do a couple more questions here. Next one is, is the critical THI, uh, the same for cows producing 100 pounds versus 80 pounds or any other production? I would say yes. Um, because while production level does tend to influence it. Um, I would say both of those are fairly high producing cows, so more susceptible to heat stress to start with. Um, and then we also see a lot of individual variability in terms of um, breed and even within breed, individual differences in a cow's ability to cope with heat load. So I think it, it's, it's essentially the same um, because it's not worth picking apart the nuances of uh, an 80 cow, cow, 80 pound cow versus a 100 pound cow. Margaret, do you have other thoughts on that? I might add that uh, 100 pound cows tend to eat a little more uh, to produce that 100 pounds than an 80 pound cow might. Um, and therefore she might make a little bit more metabolic heat versus that 80 pound cow. So she, though I'm not sure about the research, she may begin to exhibit signs of heat stress a little bit earlier than May, maybe a little bit earlier than the 80 pound cow, depending on how much more she eats. Um, but I think I'm trying to, I'm try, I was trying to remember off the top of my head what the cows were producing when they decided that 68 was, a, was the number. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're noticing your higher producing cows, any, any of the signs that we talked about, a uh, drop in milk or decreased feed intake or, or panting or increased respiration, any of those signs then um, for your herd, you might need to start your heat abatement uh, strategies a little bit earlier than other farms. Great, thank you both for that answer. Um, and then our last question of the day is going to be, can heat stress affect milk fatty acid profile? I know there is quite a lot of research looking at that, at that um, question. And I know that the answer is yes, it affects it. I don't know all of the ways in which that it does. Um, just because there's been a lot of really um, robust research in that area and it's a lot to a lot to parse through and it's not something that I've specifically focused on. I would agree with Alicia but I, I do know that um, there is a lot of good research out there. I think Minor Institute and Dave Barbano at Cornell would probably be able to answer those questions since they're doing a lot of the milk fatty acid profile um, research work out there. So feel free to email them. I think you can find at least Barbano on the Pro Dairy site or on the Cornell site. Otherwise, uh, please email us and we can get you connected with somebody who can help answer that question better. Great, thank you, uh, Margaret and Alicia for bringing so much really useful um, and timely information today. Uh, thank you all of you who have taken the time out of your day to be on here live with us. Um, we will be, we've recorded this webinar. We will have it posted to the Pro Dairy website um, probably within a week or so. Um, if you've got any questions, yep, Margaret's put her email in the, um, in the chat box. We'll have Alicia do the same. 
um, and you can just follow up with either of us or with either of them uh, with any questions. Uh, and then also just a shout out to Kathy Barrett um, from Pro Dairy. She's been instrumental in helping us get, get this uh, webinar put together. Um, so thank you all and hope you have a great afternoon.